You're listening to Intelligent Data, a podcast by Proficient. Proficient is a global digital consultancy that's transforming how the world's biggest brands connect with customers and grow their businesses. Throughout this series, you'll learn how valuable data is today and how it can transform your business. And now here's our host, Arvind Morali, Data Chief Strategist and Principal at Proficient. Hello and welcome to the Intelligent Data Podcast. I'm very excited to have the data management whisperer, Scott Taylor, in this episode. He talks to us about his priority and messaging around calming data. We touched upon key topics around putting data to work, including the key elements that goes into data management. In addition, we also touched upon the frameworks that he's written in his book, Telling Your Data Story, a must have. We talked about the eight halves of data management professionals. So in a nutshell, this episode is the story about data itself and not the story with data. It was a great conversation with fantastic frameworks and takeaways for data leaders telling their data management story. Hope you enjoy it. It is such a privilege and honor to introduce my guest today, Scott Taylor, the Data Whisperer. Scott's an author, speaker, a coach, and offering data evangelism as a service for data management strategists and practitioners. Using techniques such as 3Vs, Scott has gained the trust and business of several tech executives to tell a compelling data story. As he simplified the definition, data is the truth, analytics is the meaning. Uh, he's going to give us some guidance on several data management topics such as quality, master data, and so on and so forth. Scott, welcome to the Intelligent Data Podcast. Thank you, Arvin. Great to be here. Can you uh, introduce yourself, your brand, and what you do in the field of data management, possibly in less than two minutes? <laughs> Scott Taylor, the Data Whisperer, help calm data down. That's what data whispering does. It helps calm data down. Data is unruly and unstructured and a mess and dirty and corrupt and all those other things that people say about data. we got to calm it down. That's what we do in the data management side of the business. I am myopically focused on helping data practitioners and data leaders explain the strategic value of proper data management to their business associates as well as helping business leaders understand that as well. My view is data management is the foundation of literally everything a company does when it tries to do things at scale. And it's very much an unsung hero behind the scenes. So while, as you mentioned, the meaning side analytics gets a lot of attention, (laughs) data management doesn't. And you got to determine the truth before you derive meaning, in my view. I'm 20-something years in the data management space, worked at Nielsen, done at Bradstreet, consulted for WPP, the world's largest ad agency, for a while. But all of this was around helping people understand these foundational aspects of data management. Mm. I guess your logo, putting data to work, which is appropriate for data management professionals, um, you know, aligns with your thinking there, what you said. Now, you know, it's it's hard to tell a data management story, you know, without being too technical. I know analytics gets a lot of, uh, you know, attention because it tells the business story. How do you put that, you know, the attention to data management to say, this is not just about technology components like master data and data quality. How do you speak that business language or how do you relate it to the business language? You start with the business language. If you want to speak to the business, you've got to speak in the language of the business. So the technical stuff, reference data architecture, here's our wonderful way we're going to plug all these APIs in. That's all the how. I focus on the why, why it's important. And every business leader I've ever dealt with doesn't want to get to the how until they understand the why. So you've got to focus as a data management expert on why your business exists, why your business is trying to do what it's doing, why your business brings value to its relationships through its brands. Analytics gets more attention because it's easier to see. Let's just lay it out there. I can see analytics. There is data visualization on the business intelligence side as a whole practice area. Yeah, you can't really see the, the, the data management side. You can feel it. You feel it, but you don't really see it. 
Yeah, plus, you know, the, the historically speaking, analytics is always driven by business requirements, if you will, right? That there's always a need for you to go build a KPI. KPI aligns to a business metric, if you will, automatically. Versus data management has, especially this goes to all the tech vendors and, you know, different vendors out there who are selling data management capabilities like master data as a system versus master data for dealing with your customers and their corresponding relationships, right? They don't sell it like that. They sell it as a system with a bunch of capabilities aligned to a particular data management discipline. So it is tough to enable your customers, Scott, uh, the people you work with, to tell that compelling business story. How do you make them see that? To dig into a little bit of what you just said, you know, data management answers very compelling business requirements as well. The basic business requirements, like how many customers do we have? What's their hierarchical structure? What kind of categories are we good in or not good in? What geographies are important? These are all things that are managed on the data management side. They're not in analytics. Analytics uses those dimensions, but if they're not highly structured and consistent and shared across an organization, then you have two analytic outputs about what looks to be the same thing, but they're disconnected. So the basic questions of a business, how many customers do I have? Where are they? Who are they? Who owns them? These are all things in the data management side. And to tell that story and start wrapping it up, I encourage people to look at the essence of their business. How does that business provide value to its relationships through its brands at scale? The at scale part takes technology, technology, hardware, software, data. If you have data, you need data management. That's a really short, abbreviated version of how to put that in play and get your CEO's attention. And as you suggest, people are focused on the tool part, on the platform part, on the feature and functionality, which is great if you're in the technical side. But if you're the business side, you really don't care about that. You care about why is this even important at all? So every CEO I ever met wants to do better with their relationships, wants to have their brands bring more value, wants to do it at scale. Every CEO I've ever met doesn't want to talk about data quality. Mm. But if you don't have good data quality, then the data you're trying to use to bring value to relationships for your brands at scale won't work. You won't get that scale part. Scale is such a huge piece of where a lot of enterprises gin up the value they've got. Makes sense. You've consistently honed in on these four business themes customers, relationship, brand, and products and services. And then you use the word at scale quite a bit, right? Now, interestingly, digital transformation, the word that's overused, overhyped at this point, if you fundamentally look at it, that is more ways of creating more data, new ways of consuming more data, which means big data is becoming bigger. AI is becoming more intelligent. Or I don't know if that's a word. But nevertheless, how, do you... Add any more themes to these four things, the customer relationship, brand, products, and services to represent an organization? Or do you see any changes as there is more data, more ways of consuming, and more ways of creating? I try and find that consistency. It's A lot of the work I do is how do you boil stuff down to its basic atomic level? While there might be more data about brands, every organization has a brand. Every organization has relationships. Mm-hmm. I can't get it down more, you know, more atomic than that. So I look for in the new themes and the new trends and the new hype, where are we going to find what we already know? Digital, you know, data-driven marketing. Well, that's marketing at scale. It's still marketing. <laughs> marketing is about- More intelligent marketing, I guess. Yeah, right? more intelligent marketing, personalization, all that other stuff is, I don't see the basics changing. You know, I do a lot of content, as you know, on LinkedIn and elsewhere, and people talk a lot about content and engagement and followers. I started off in the media business. In the media business, you you learned about editorial, readership, same thing. So there are nuances that make things new, but I'm always looking at and listening for, okay, where am I going to hear the comments with the standard stuff, the foundational stuff? It's always in there. 
Now, this is very helpful. To be honest with you, I use a lot of these four themes for my discussions with executives, the customer relationship, brand, and products. Sure. There's nothing more simpler that can explain my all of my frameworks and you know architecture back to these four things and say, this is what data can do for you, right? But how, how did you end up here? Um, Scott, you know, you, you mentioned that your experience with Nielsen, Nielsen is a data monetization company, right? So can you maybe give us your history and your research of how you ended up with these four themes? And I would even boil your, your four down to two because products are part of brand and customers are part of relationships, mm. just as a way to kind of solve for X even further in that equation, if you will. Fair enough. Relationships, customer, vendor, partner, prospect, all the kinds of parties you deal with. And then brand, which can be product offering, service, location, banner. Every company has a brand. So how did I get where I am today? I started off my first real data job was working at part of a company that is now part of Nielsen through a lot of acquisitions and so on. Little teeny company. They had a store. It's called Progressive Grocer, Progressive Grocer Magazine. It was a trade magazine that went to every store manager in the country in 1969, which I was still in school, so I wasn't there then. Somebody realized, oh, we're mailing a magazine to every store manager in the country. We actually have a list of every store. Boom. So this database of stores was born. It moved along for dozens of years. I got there and was selling this database, this book of stores to consumer package goods manufacturers. And I started to hear them talk about things they were doing with this data that we weren't really selling it for. Like, oh, you have a unique number on every record. We're matching that to our unique number, our customer number internally. It was like, oh, what's that? Or you have this hierarchy structure that rolls up store to account to ship to, build to, plan to, all these different levels we work at. We're trying to maintain that on our own. You guys have this great, pristine, comprehensive universe file of all these locations. We'd like to use yours. And I listened enough and started to find, okay, not to break any confidentiality with any company, but if Coke is telling me how they're using something, Pepsi is probably going to want to use it the same way, General Mills and Kellogg. So we started talking to all these package goods companies and realized we had a different kind of business, which was managing and to a certain extent, helping manufacturing companies outsource their customer master maintenance keep the unique identity, help them with hierarchies, help them with taxonomies in terms of categorization of channels and subchannels, help them with geographies, different markets, sales market, media market, measurement market. The biggest challenge was the discipline in terms of narrowing the focus of this business and this offering to really go after the biggest opportunity. And because we had this unique number that began to get syndicated, I branded this number. I called it a TD links code. TD stood for trade dimensions, which is what the data part of the progressive gross organization was called. And the thing took off like nobody could have planned. We'd had a tremendous business. We became a de facto standard for location identification in the packaged goods world in the United States. We went from 30,000 store records to over a million locations with restaurants, bars, nightclubs, convenience stores, drug stores, anywhere, anybody who had a product in the fast moving consumer goods space would want to put their information into your database if you will yeah and then and then well we were really just the you know we were the master file and the universe file of the industry and and you know we got coke and pepsi to agree which was a marvelous thing to happen so i never looked back after that so for me that was okay wow that's where i got the bug for what structured master data can do for an organization because our clients were not bragging here as much as just sort of sharing their experience, they were really thrilled to even have somebody to help them with this at the level we could. So essentially your product, your productization of, as you said, DB of stores, if you will, that one was your first foray into master data. It, it makes sense because that's where you were born and brought up with that thinking of master data, which later became an official capability called master data itself, right? Um, and then from there came up with all these unique, um, I guess, or the most atomic way to represent an organization, customer relationship, brand, and products. 
Makes sense. The challenge I had was IT people got it. So where I hone my early techniques and be able to explain this, you know, what I, I don't actually work with data. I talk about talking about data. We all have a role in the space. That's mine. I play my part well, but I think I, you know, I stay in my lane. How do you explain it better? So business people will give you the support and the funding you need to do the work you know is going to help them. I would talk to IT people. They go, yeah, we get it. Data model, this primary key, you got hierarchy. That's all great. You do matching. But the business isn't asking for it. That was the most common excuse I would hear. And I would think, well, the business doesn't even know to ask for this. Can you come and explain this to our business, you know, to our CFO, to our head of sale? Sure. So you can't explain it to them by using the same terminology you use to talk to IT people. You had to explain it in much plainer, simpler language, which is where I came from, being a natural storyteller and come from a family of storytellers. It's like, all right, how do I, make, how do I get this thing off the page and make it sing? And so that's where I kind of honed all that technique of explaining what most people feel is rather boring, dull piece of the space into something that at least will get some kind of excitement and passion around it. So in, in the last couple of years, interesting, you made that point about IT understanding, you know, the, the value of master data. Do you think business is now better positioned to talk about data and data management? Because I, I kind of feel that all the clients I talk to already know what, I'm talking the non-technical business people. They know what master data is. I don't have to explain them the discipline, right? To your point, what they don't speak about, maybe they don't think like that, is how does data and data management enable their business unit, right? They don't know how to articulate it. Do you think IT is positioned uh, these days, you know, to go and talk that way, to extract the meaning of data behind their business? Are you seeing that trend? No. I'm, what I'm seeing is more the, you know, personified by the chief data officer, that data office. That's where it seems to be landing. I wish that was around when I started my career because we always had trouble finding the right person who was a technically astute, business-oriented person who sat in the middle and went, okay, I, I know the how and I know the why. Whether it's a chief data officer or just the data office, those folks, I believe, are supposed, you know, they own data for an organization. They have to understand both sides of it. And I think maybe that's relieved IT folks from having to really represent something that, I mean, frankly, they haven't really represented well, which is, okay, why are we doing, what's the value of this to the business side? We're doing the infrastructure we're focused on, systems we're focused on, not diminishing that at all. You've got to have the how, you've got to have that working. But we hear often, and we still hear more and more, this disconnect between technical how and the business why. Absolutely. So I'm going to ask you a very interesting question. One of your favorite topics, data is the new oil. (laughs) (laughs) So you, you know, and I'm hopefully I'm coming across as data is the new oil, the metaphor and not the simile, because folks like Doug Laney have pretty much talked about that topic at length from a simile perspective that it is not similar. Right. right. Yeah. But I'm talking about the economic uh, motivator, the, the way electricity or oil did, uh, you know, back in the days. Right. So it seems like data is the new oil. However, the challenge is IT doesn't speak that way. I mean, I use this, this term quite a lot to talk to my clients. Part of the reason I use it is, again, I, I state it in my email or my conversation that I'm talking about the metaphor. Uh, why? Because data can be used as a valuable asset in the organization. Scott, in your conversations with executives, do you see that business wants to use data as the oil to monetize them, to use them for their advantage? Are you seeing that passion and the interest in business people? Taking a sidestep on just that ditno, as I call it, data is a new <laughs> oil. My challenge with it is it doesn't clearly articulate in most cases what the speaker is trying to communicate. And it has just taken a life of its own in the data space. 
Is it a metaphor? Is it a simile? Is it new? Is it not new? No, it's not oil. It's sun. It's energy. It's so this struggle we have. I take a step back and go, why are we so focused on this intense, ridiculous, almost, you know, existential debate among ourselves about whether data is or is not oil or is or is not new? Because we have trouble talking about the value. A good metaphor, a good simile shortens the communication cycle. All you got to do is look in LinkedIn and you'll find, you know, me on one side, some people on the other side debating this oil thing, which proves my point that says, okay, if we can't even agree and it's not clear to all of us, then it's not going to be clear to the audience we're pointing at, which leads me to what I feel is recent observation. One of the biggest problems in the data space isn't it technical? One of the biggest problems in the data space is how we talk about it and the struggle we have talking about it and the new terminology. And I don't know another department in an enterprise that is so self-referential and on its own terminology where you have people saying, we got to use this analytics graph hub fabric mesh and then complain about buzzwords <laughs> right. in the same sentence. And you go, Marketing people don't, you know, marketing people have buzzwords, but sales doesn't, operations doesn't. We're not, those parts of the organization aren't in this existential debate about why it should exist or should not exist or what is it or what's the best metaphor. They just really focus more on the job. Now, I'm exaggerating this difference for dramatic effect. You're right. What we're trying to communicate with that reference is way more important than the, the literal you know, metaphor or simile debate. But to your point, I was Googling data is the new oil and the top five links that showed up, we're all talking about a debate. One person versus the other debating is data the new oil with all Bingo. the literal parameters. And Who I'm thinking cares? to myself, yeah, exactly. We're trying to communicate a point that data is valuable to you. You can monetize it. You can measure it and you can use it for your business. I don't care if data is the new oil or not. The graphic, the story that kind of reinvigorated that phrase is a story about how data is like oil was when the oil barons and the oil, you know, the first oil companies were were monopolizing the flow and distribution of a really important asset. And the story that most people reference in their first slide talking about how valuable data is and they put that up there all they have to do is read the subhead of that story and it says it's, it's about antitrust regulations and maybe they should be the government should be regulating the large data platforms is that a positive story no is that a fun story no is that a great story to talk about how wonderful data is no 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 so don't use these cliche my recommendation is to go back to the business language talk about your business Right. If we could put a moratorium on new things, read all you have to do is read LinkedIn, right? It pops up. We the death of the data lake. It's like didn't data lakes just start happening? No, it's the data <laughs> mesh. No, it's the data lake house. No, you need a data lake housekeeper. No, it's the people are trying to make it all they're trying to make it a new thing. And there seems to be this badge of honor in the data space that if you can come up with a new term that is the new latest thing that replaced that thing that you used to think was the coolest thing, then you're, you know, you're in, but people, they don't stick. Stuff doesn't stick and it doesn't stick with the business side at all. So sorry to go on a rant here, but it's. No, no, you, you've just brought up a very important point, right? I, I think if we, the people who know that and don't care about did know, talk about it for two to three minutes, think about, you know, the, the folks we talk to every day, the, the people who run organizations, they're going to go to LinkedIn or Google or what have you. And the challenge is, which you've articulated earlier, IT is always going after the next new shiny object, whether it's a data lake to the data lake house to the next new next best thing. But they're not fundamentally looking at, I need data for solving my business problems, Right. And they're not looking at that because they're always going after the next new shiny object, whatever that may be. And now the newest object is mesh, as you as you rightly stated, right? So now in the meanwhile, business is trying to use the data. They're trying to monetize the data. And monetization does not mean you make you just make money out of it. It also means how you can use it for operational purposes 
to save money within your organization, whether you make your supply chain more efficient, whether you make your marketing more uh, personalized, right? Those are all different ways of monetizing your data internally, not externally. We're not asking everybody to become a, a Dun and Bradstreet or a Nielsen, right? Um, I, I think you've nailed that, uh, Scott, in your way of saying, we're always worried about the next new shiny thing, which is what IT is doing, and not worried about how can my organization thrive in this digital economy. I've got a lot more data. How can I use it? Exactly. And even think of the word monetization. I'm glad you put that qualifier. But if I go, to, if I'm going to have a meeting with a business leader and the topic is data monetization, they're going to go to the root of that word, which is money. Yep. There's lots of ways to capture value. Cash is everyone's favorite, <laughs> but that's not everything people do with data. So think really seriously about if you want to have a data monetization conversation with somebody and then spend the first couple minutes trying to recalibrate their understanding of the word monetization in that context, you may succeed, but you've just wasted a whole bunch of time explaining a word to them in a different way than they thought it was meant. Is that a valuable part of the conversation? I would suggest no. So data monetization for most folks, okay, selling our data. No, we can't sell our data. So you start correctly is the advice I give everybody. Start with the strategic intention of your enterprise. Where's your business going? How is it trying to deliver value to its relationships through its brands at scale? Fill in the blanks. What are the relationships? What are the brands? What does scale mean to you? And show how better data is going to enable those because it always will. It always, always, always will. Right, right. Absolutely. So let's talk about, you know, we, we've spent some time on the why part. Let's talk about the how. I've read your book, Scott, and it was you know, a phenomenal way for me to assemble information, if you will, right? Thank you. So, yeah, the, the telling your data story, data storytelling for data management. If if listeners, if you if you all haven't read it, I would highly advise it. It will give you good idea on structuring your conversation around data management. Ninety nine percent buzzword free, so that's a guarantee. Right on the cover it says it right on the cover. It's guaranteed ninety nine percent buzzword free. It absolutely does. I want to hit on three topics within the book. <laughs> Let's start with your eight eights of data management. Uh, again, for me, it helped me assemble my thinking into a framework so I can explain it easier to a CXO, right? Or to somebody, a data management strategist or a thought leader. So how did you come up with the eight eights of data management without giving away too much secret sauce from the book? Maybe can you explain us your thinking or your thought process to land there? It was all part of how do you explain this very clearly? And so I challenged myself to boil things down. When I was at Nielsen selling the TD Links product, we didn't call them. The, we had a couple of eights. We had like validate, integrate, aggregate, and communicate. Then I got to Dun & Bradstreet and realized I had to expand this. I added some more in order evaluate, which was analytics, interoperate, which is being able to communicate or be able to, to, to link and work seamlessly with other partners using standardized data. Relate became the pinnacle because it was building relationships. The true history of the eight eights is that I had seven. So I loved it. I was like, all right, seven eights. I get it. It's like, this is seven eights. That's fun. And I was working. We were out presenting it. And there was a guy who was working with me. He just kept going, you know, Scott, that's, that's not enough. It just doesn't feel right. Seven just doesn't. You need eight. You need eight eights, man. So the next day, that night, I'm going, okay, he's right. The next day, the presentation included the eighth eight, which was circulate, moving data. It became the most dramatic part of the presentation for me because I run around the stage and start talking about circuit, but data to have value has got to be in motion. It can't be locked in some PDF or stuck in a silo or held tightly by somebody who doesn't report their own way for all these years. Those days are over. So these eight eights, going back to them, became for me 
all the ways people can get value out of data. And I challenge audiences to come up with a ninth. No one's broke it yet. It's funny because when they do suggest something, it always ends with eight. So they kind of are, somebody said, gesticulate. I said, I think that's part of communicate. So, but it starts with this idea of validate, right? You got to validate a relationship. Then you want to integrate, aggregate, interoperate, evaluate, communicate circulate and all of this points to your ability to relate to build relationships grow relationships improve relationships and mapping those so the technique is take those you know fun pithy rhyming things and map them to what you do mm-hmm. in your organization and then you have what can be an, a pleasant to listen to and a story <laughs> and progression about how you're bringing value to to your business through data. I would challenge you on one thing, Scott. So let me ask you this. Sure. There is one eight that I think is missing, but I okay. also think it falls somewhere else. This could be the Ed- ninth eight. I'm ready. Here we go. Educate. So I know communicate. You've talked about communicate quite a bit, but you know there's a whole um, discipline around data literacy. How do I educate? my non-technical folks to start using data to their fullest advantage, right? I don't know if that falls in any of your eights, eight eights, uh, but that's something I was thinking about as I was going through the, the, the reading. I appreciate that suggestion. I would either put it in to communicate or actually say it's not a way people get value out of data. You get value out of data by being more literate, about it Uh as a person, as a practitioner, but putting it to work, is that really putting data to work for your organization through education? It feels a couple steps away. So I'll, I'll accept your challenge. I'll think about it. I don't know if I'm going to nine, but it's always good to get feedback. It it doesn't ring a bell like eight eights. It doesn't nine eights of, of data management. It's not that cool. Like eight eights. That's, yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure. So that, that leads me to, to kind of the next topic, data literacy, right? So this, the thing I like about the eight eights is that it's focused on data management. Yes, you can make an exception. You can say evaluating data is an analytics discipline, uh, but, you know, evaluating is also data profiling. You're trying to figure out what your data says to solve a business problem. And I'm thinking to myself, how can I now use to put a training and communication plan for folks who are non-technical to start using data? Because, you know, one thing I always tell organizations when I talk to is that you may be data savvy, but you may not be data literate. Samir Sharma and I, we had a debate about this in one of our podcasts, and he disagrees fundamentally that data literacy is not necessarily a discipline because everybody is data literate. We've been data literate for since the stone ages, right? You've seen cavemen drawing buffalo hunting as pictures. That's a piece of data sitting in a stone. So to some extent that is true, but I'm thinking to myself, how can people be data literate in this new world of modern data creation and consumption where you have a lot more data to think about, not just first party, but even third party data, right? So what do you think about data literacy as a discipline? Is, is it hitting the nodes? Do you see gaps there? What are your thoughts? Going back to your comment about cave drawings being data based on Flintstone timing, that would actually make data older than oil for all you data is the new oil fans. <laughs> so think about that before you use that comment. Fair enough. <laughs> data literacy, I think it's a, I look at it from, the bleachers a little bit. I'm not deeply steeped in that discipline. I encourage it. I think it's important for people to understand and be able to articulate and argue and communicate with data, whatever that means. I can't really speak to whether it's hitting all the the sweet spots. There's a lot of great experts out there focused on that. I encourage it as much as I can and say, okay, we also need to be business literate. Let's not forget that. So data people focused on making sure business people understand data is important, but data people should also be focused on understanding their own business as well. That'll help them explain what they're doing better. But I admire the folks in in data literacy tremendously because they're trying to push that 
and build that enthusiasm and get people to be not as scared of it. Data scared. We live in data. We know data. We understand it. We the ups and downs or whatever. But people who are not exposed to it get a little scared, get apprehensive, have all those common snap judgments about what it's going to do to their job. How do we get those folks into the tent and have them realize that it's a valuable asset that's going to actually help them do their work better? No doubt. You know, folks like Jordan Morrow are constantly yeah. preaching, uh, talking about the importance of data, right? I mean, there, there, there will be a day very soon where our fridge is going to talk to our phone, is going to talk to our watch, is going to talk to our TV. All of these devices are going to talk to each other using data. And that's not, that's not some sci-fi anymore. The devices already have IoT enablement. It's just that how are you going to use that data to your advantage, right? My single sentence business requirement for things like that in the IoT are everything needs to connect to everything else when it should. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When it should. So, yes, my if my bed and alarm clock could talk to my coffee maker, that's a good conversation. But I don't know if my blender needs to talk to my neighbor's garage. <laughs> All right. So the should part and should means authenticated identity. It means, you know, security, privacy. So I put that word should when I thought about it in there because it was very important. Sure. But there's, but there's still lots and lots to be done in that space. If you look at identification in the Internet of Things and you spell it out, it's actually I-D-I-O-T which is idiot. I saw that. Yeah. It was, that was very, very, uh, bold. <laughs> how, are, how do you explain on a podcast works better visually? Right. Right. But I yeah. feel like there's a message in that, a warning in that, right. That we should, uh, pay attention to. I, I D I O T. We'll, we'll make sure we, we put, uh, some show put that notes. in there. Yes. Yes. Um, awesome. Hey, so, there was a very provocative argument last year about has data management failed? And then you've had some answer to that saying, no, it has not. That's how I believe this three B's of data management, the vocabulary, voice, and vision, which I love uh, hmm. both in your book and how you've kind of, you know, showed that it's a valuable topic or discussion to organize your conversation. I mean, t tell us a little bit about those three V's. My feeling was to put a story together, I needed to give people, as you said, kind of the eight eights, the four C's, the three phases, all this other stuff. Give them a pithy structure, especially helping data practitioners who were not necessarily spent their career like I did developing their soft skills. How do you articulate that value? So with a knowing wink to big data, I came up with these three V's, vocabulary, voice, and vision. Starting with the first one, you've got to create an accessible vocabulary. We already talked about speaking the language of the business. What's in your business glossary? What does your industry standards organizations say? How do they call things? Back to my Nielsen days, retailers called locations, stores, restaurateurs called locations, outlets. You didn't want to mix those together. You want to speak the language of that vertical, really important. I call relationships, you were talking about customer, vendor, partner, citizen, patient, you know, there's lots of different domains. So you want to build this, you want to have this accessible business oriented vocabulary. Then you want to harmonize that pitch, which is the kind of story you're telling to a common voice. And harmony doesn't mean everybody sings the same notes, but it does mean they all sound good together. Very practical advice around making sure you have an elevator pitch. What are the couple of points you want to share if you do have an hour with your team or 10 minutes at the board meeting or a minute with your CEO, what is that message you want to convey to them? Then the big, biggest V and the rationale for all of it is pointing that activity at the vision of your company. How does it enable the strategic intention of your enterprise? How do you show that the vision of your company is supported by, and in most cases, isn't even accessible or reachable unless you have proper data management at the foundation. And the techniques around that are understanding your business direction. Where's your company trying to go? What do your leaders say? None of them are going to say we need better data quality, but they are going to say we want to move from uh, selling the 
value of our widgets as a tangible object to licensing that value in an as a service subscription offering. That's a very hugely strategic move by a lot of organizations. If you're a data manager and you're not in that conversation, you're missing the boat and your organization isn't going to be able to move to as a service if you don't have the proper structured, highly governed, expertly stewarded data underneath about those same domains, relationships, and brands. That makes sense. Is there a specific sequence to this, Scott? So I almost feel that vision comes first, followed by vocabulary and voice. But There's only three, so start wherever you like, but voice is usually last because that's the hardest to tune. But find that vision, find a vocabulary. The voice just comes naturally on how you put those two things together and tell that story. But it doesn't go, I don't go very deep. I'm very thin, but broad, proud of that range. But don't overthink it is my advice. Okay, do we have the right words? Are we talking about the same way? And is it focused on what our company's trying to do? Simple questions to ask yourself before you go off and try and proudly show your new reference data architecture or your data model that you worked all week on. And it's about simplification. I mean, I, I use the words like now, new, next, for example, right? The reason I use that is because that shows what's the art of the possible in the next, right? And then the new is what's up and coming. And the now is your current state. So these yeah. are easier ways to represent information. So a CXO can remember that because, you know, if I do a data strategy with a CXO, that means they got to go sell that to somebody in the business to go execute on the data management, right? Exactly. And the easier I, I put the information, the easier I assemble the information using the three we's or the eight eights easier they can go tell it to somebody else. They don't care about reference architecture and capability and technology, right? And you've hit upon the purpose of the work I've been doing, which is to help people explain it better. That's why the book's called Telling Your Data Story. It's like how to put it together. It isn't your data story. It's telling it. <laughs> oh, I, I like it. <laughs> Love it. That, that goes to my uh, next segment, which is branding. So, Scott, you've done a phenomenal job in branding your thought leadership using things like the puppet show. Let's let's start there. So, you know, the first time I saw the puppet show, it hit so many nodes on me as an IT guy. You know, it, it's not just because it made sense. It's also because it's lightweight and, it, I, and I enjoyed seeing it, right, hearing it. What was your motivation behind the puppet show and, and where are you with part two and part three and beyond? Well, th first of all, thank you. My motivation was to get the reactions that you just described. How do we take a step aside and make a little fun of the space we're in, but also have a point? And I pride myself on my range, so I can write really serious white papers and that kind of stuff. But I can also make the same point with cartoons and puppet shows. And believe me, the latter is much more fun. Yeah, the data management as it is, is already a pretty dry topic. Right, I, I don't want to write any more white papers. <laughs> so it was how to break through my personal brand. How do I get known for a certain kind of voice? I try and stay really disciplined around the messaging, which is always the strategic value of proper data management. Absolutely. And the puppets just kind of came to me. You know, creative process is... Not always, you know, it's hardly ever a linear process. One thing builds on another. I had done a puppet at Dun & Bradstreet for an internal series that the HR department was doing around, they had a theme, just being confident. So I created this character that was a B and his name was Dean B. Mm. So you have Dean B, Dean B. And it was like everybody from the CEO on down, I would explain to them, they go like, oh. And it was one of those, like, how could nobody else have ever come up with a character called Dean B at D and B? Right. So that puppet was there, and I had already kind of made a full character around him. He became the ITB with all the buzzwords. That's natural. B, buzz, that's easy. The CDO, the chief dog officer. I needed kind of a hero character, monkey business, who is, you know, this goofy monkey who doesn't really seem to understand anything. I think one of his lines that became one of the quotes of the week by one of the publications was, if big data is so big, how come I can't see it? <laughs> I'm a little dizzy from our customer 360. And he falls down to the ground, spinning around. So, and it was a blast. I leaned on my dramatic training. Puppets are certainly fun. I put that thing out there and it was 
bigger than I, it hit a chord, as you suggest, with you two, that I didn't totally expect. My intention was to be able to, you know, entertain a few people, but it just, it was a, it was a big hit. And I was thrilled. I had people literally, when it came out that same week, one of my favorite comments was, I'm, I have to redo my presentation for my Gartner session. Can I use your puppets? It was like, yeah, sure. Take a picture of it. So, you know, got into Gartner somehow. So not to miss an opportunity to find more opportunities. I went, all right, I got to, I had to write the book last year. That was my most creative project, biggest project. This year it is the epic multi-part series about the puppets of data and their crazy journey through all the mistakes that all of us make. So we'll have the ITB and the chief dog officer. First thing you got to do in the data space when you don't know what to do is you got to hire a high price consultant. So they're hiring a cat sultan from Meow Kinsey. <laughs> Meow Kinsey. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Used to work at Accenture. I'm still working on some of the stuff. There'll be some other crazy characters. They're going to do some demos with micro spoon and sales fork. So there's a food <laughs> piece to this and I can't wait to get started. So I've got a million notes. I've got some guest voices. I'm excited to, to, to bring in some folks I've been talking to. So I will not do the whole thing myself, which would be a relief, but also be fun to kind of share some of the, the, the spotlight with some other thought leaders who I know have a dramatic element to them and hopefully it'll work. So it's, uh, I'm on my way to uh, Puppets of the Summer project and more to come on that. But I definitely felt I had to create this narrative arc. Where do they go? What do they do? How do they and make it relatable to data science, data management, demo, IT, visionary kind of thought leaders who send you astray, ridiculous terminology that I'm working on that hopefully will be kind of symbolic of the space. And it's fun. It's really, really a blast to even just think about doing. And I barely scratched the surface on it. So more to come from the puppets of data. I'm privileged you gave a little sneak peek of what's coming. <laughs> so let's talk about this Master Data Marathon. 24 hours of Master Data. What's the outcome now since you've done two of these? What does it look like? How did people enjoy it? Obviously, I was a participant too, and I absolutely enjoyed it. Didn't stay 24 hours. Uh, but what, what what do people say about it? What was their most valuable, um, I, I guess, takeaway from the 24 hours of marathon? It was actually 26.2 hours. So we got accurate this time and went a full marathon, 26.2 miles and where you run. And as I said, OK, I'm going to run my mouth for 26 point two hours fantastic it was Ooh. it was a blast some practitioners i i'm just the host and kind of the face of that event it's produced by and run by this great group called think linkers who did a very premium selective mdm conference in europe that i hosted once and was the keynote on another time so i've been building this great relationship with them COVID hit. They couldn't do, we were planning a couple of events, couldn't do it. And again, just sort of had this flash in the shower or walking around or wherever these ideas hit me. And I went, okay, MDM, Master Data Marathon, 24 hours. Let's do it. We're crazy enough to try it. So we did one in September. We did the second one last week, which I'm finally recovered from the self-imposed jet lag of staying up all night. But people were really, there became this kind of party atmosphere, which is what we were trying to gin up. I saw that spark in the first one and leaned into it for the second one. It's like, you know, Master Data keeps you up all night. Well, now let's do it for fun. Stay with us all night. See what happens. And we had, I don't know, 50 speakers, just a huge range. Some great brands were talking, Adidas. D.B. Shanker, Hugo Boss, you know, real people with real kinds of businesses that need to feed off of all this data and all these zealots, data management zealots at these organizations sharing their story, whether it was highly technical or highly conceptual or value based or implementation based, pretty wide range there. I was impressed by the amount of props that you brought to the show. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of my thing. So it was 
Yeah, I think I, I think I set a new record. I think I wore like 25 different jackets. I had all kinds of crazy stuff in my house. Props is a good word for it. And so as my prep is, all right, listen or figure out how I can relate some sort of tangible, fun little bit to what somebody is talking about in my kind of segues and introductions and keep the energy going there. So that was my job is to keep people going and somehow bring some kind of lightheartedness or positive energy to some interaction with the folks who were talking. And so that was, that was fun. You know, for the fireside chats, I have a little cardboard fire that I used and fire extinguisher and a fake marshmallow and just kind of build on that. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. I saw some of those. It was interesting because for me, uh, what I had a takeaway from the first one is that it's a good mix of speakers, right? There's to your point, there are both tactical and strategic speakers, each one having a different perspective. And it gave me a nice assembly of, uh, you know, some of the speakers I had to hear offline because I was not awake for those. Uh, Worldwide, it gave me a different perspective as to how companies think about data, master data, and how does a country or, or a particular domain play in that space. So it was a it was a very nice collection of different takeaways. I mean, in my intro and when I kicked it off, I said this thing I've said 12 times already on this podcast, listen to everybody's presentation and listen to how they're going to talk about their business, delivering value to their relationships through their brands at scale. Right, Every right. single one of them will do that. I haven't even watched them all yet, but they will all do that. Find that commonality. So if you're not in the healthcare space, you should still listen to the healthcare expert because they're going to talk about that same notion in a different way. And the challenges we see in this space, and my belief is in working with enterprises all over the world in every category at every level of maturity is the challenges they face and the opportunities they have are more the same than they are different. And I think that gives some comfort to folks when you you talk to a lot of organizations too, they feel like it's their problem. You know, I can't have all these silos, all this disparate data. We don't know what to do. We can't come up with a standard, but you know, and they think it's like just their thing specific to their business. You go, no, 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 look, this is, first of all, it's not your fault. Let's make some progress here. It's just the situation that comes out of being an enterprise. And it's, these are shared problems. Everybody's dealing with this in some way. So I believe there's some sort of solace that participants can get in these kinds of sessions where they realize it's not just me. It's not just our organization. Everybody's struggling with this in one way or the other. Absolutely. No, thank you for that. Um, Scott, I know we're running short on time. I've got a couple of, uh, uh, you know, lightning round questions for you. Oh, ready for okay. That. All right. All right. So um, I don't have a, a fire running here. We're not visual. <laughs> so <laughs> think of you standing in front of the fire. All right. Okay. What are what are a couple of your favorite books and our podcasts? You can pick one or the other or both. Well, I read a book not that long ago. I love that it was called Big Data, Big Dupe by Stephen Few, F-E-W. I liked it because he really poked a lot of holes in kind of the buzz part of what big data was trying to be podcast wise. Obviously this is one of my favorites. I haven't heard it yet, but it's, Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. There's a, a Hardy. I forgot his last name. He's going to kill me, but he does this great podcast called the artists of data science. And I did it and it was probably, probably got the most comments from that out of the blue from people. So I thought it was very effective and he kind of really delves into sort of the personal story that people have. So that was kind of fun to listen to. And I've kind of branched out, you know, for me, my message was pretty well focused on master data, reference data. That's not a big audience. So then expanded it to data management and then expanded it to, okay, the role of data management in everything else in technology I can get my hands on. So Started talking to the data science community, e-commerce, analytics, visualization, wherever there was a data, there's data problems. Wherever there's data problems, there needs to be data management. So trying to tie that value to all these different areas of the space is something I've been working on over the last year or so. Harpreet Sahoda, there you go. I don't want to mispronounce. Yes. 
any you, did you do anything special in the covid lockdown other than launching two 26 hour master data marathons my big project was the book it was okay we're not going anywhere for a while i've been thinking about writing a book for a while i'm never going to get this time again i better do it now you're done with excuses that was my inner monologue so that was probably the biggest tangible thing that came out of not that we're totally out of covid yet but out of that experience certainly last summer. And I spent a lot of time working on my digital presence on the ability to, because I have this dramatic arts training and did all this stuff in college and theater and things like that. I love being on stage. That was gone as an opportunity. I had done some webinars and so on, but I really began to focus on honing my skills through this different kind of medium. You know, when you just have a camera and it's just on your face, you're limited what you can do physically, you eye contact, you know, a lot of those techniques and spend and continue to learn from experts and in, in the field any way I can on how to really be better at that way of communication. If I may say so myself, your your digital presence has increased significantly in the last six months and I'm following you closely in, in LinkedIn. And oh, cool. <laughs> the, the amount of contents, again, I, I would say this, right? Uh, we've got some phenomenal frameworks like the industry analysts such as Gartner's and Forrester's are always publishing. They're, they're doing a lot of good work. They're researching a lot. The challenge is they're way too much detail, right? When you're talking to a CXO, you can use statistics from Gartner, like what's the, the world of big data look like and what are some of the problems you're facing? But the frameworks are too detailed. So really appreciate your uh, intention of bringing conversations to simplicity. I think you've done a phenomenal job in the book. Thank you, Arvin. Thank you, Arvin. Scott, what advice do you give to our listeners, especially data management executives that are, you know, trying to understand this journey in the world of digital? Learn your business. It's impossible for you to know too much about your business. Understand your business from the business side before you start spouting off all the things you can do with data. Understand your business. I mean, I gave the same advice to my kids who actually, two of them are in the data space and they're respective jobs and said, just learn, learn, learn what your business does, how it does it. And you will find your opportunities for how data can help it. So that's my professional advice to every data person out there is you can't, you, it's impossible for you to know too much about your own business. It just is. So keep finding those things out. Learn your business, you say. Not only are you are you invested, now you're making your kids invest in data management space as well. My kids, apparently, no, they both said, we knew more about data than a lot of people we talked to. We just, because we've been, you know, in the back of the car where you're on phone calls or hearing you, ch- all of a sudden, a lot of <laughs> things you were talking about, Dad, made sense. It's like, hooray. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Thank you so much for joining us in the Intelligent Data Podcast. You brought a lot of energy in our podcast today. I have learned a lot about data management, both by reading your book and and participating or listening to your contents, if you will. Uh, Appreciate the words of wisdom. I will continue to follow you in LinkedIn for all the exciting and wonderful events, especially Puppet Show, the sequel. (laughs) I, I will look forward for that. Thank you so much for your time, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. This was fun. Thanks for tuning in to Intelligent Data with Arvind Morali. Subscribe to our podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. You can find this season along with show notes at Perficient.com. Or listen to this series on top podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, Spotify, or Amazon.